it's it's been a fun day. So it's been enjoyable. Uh, got a lot of things going on. So it's interesting questions and a lot of fun. The, the good part for us is when we get to next Friday and we get back to the football itself. That's a good question. Um, I think when I first came into this league, uh, there weren't many spread offenses, and we were the only team that had shiny helmets, and now everybody runs a spread offense, and everybody has shiny helmets. So um, I think the game itself has changed, so I think you have to change with it. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll, I've had great experience since, since I left um, Oregon from a football standpoint, you know, so being in the NFL for four years, and then last year being out and getting a chance to study the game, um, you know, was – I think will help me, and and I think as a as a staff when we put together, I think we're we're we're, we're cognizant of, of how do we put our players in the best position to make plays. So. What'd you learn sitting out? What, what was that like for you? That was interesting. It was my gap year, um, <laughs> and uh, I had fun. So I I'd always talk to our players about getting out of their comfort zone. So um, that was as far out of my comfort zone as I have been. So, um, but I worked with really good people, and it was a lot of fun. Um, I got a chance to spend a lot of time during the week watching film. And I had to break down college tape from all different conferences uh, to prepare for games on Saturday. Uh, and then did, did some work with the NFL and got a chance to break down their stuff. So um, not focusing on one opponent, which you usually do during the week, um, but focusing on just the overall kind of take a, taking a macro view of things I think was, uh, was beneficial. So I, I kind of enjoyed that, just kind of where the game is headed, what people are doing. Um, some people at different schools that you're like, wow, how did they, you know, how did New Mexico run for so many yards? So you get a chance to take time, you know, in season, if you were at another school, you don't get a chance to watch New Mexico film unless you're playing New Mexico. So, you know, you got a chance to, to watch some different people and see how different people did things and then say, you know, you kind of put that in, in, in your folders and your resumes and everything that so you kind of look at and just say, you know, when I get somewhere, if that's, do we have people that can run that? That's another way to do things. So. I think it's it's everything, and I think what what good coaches do is they implement um, based upon what their players can handle. Um, so I, I was exposed to a lot of really good coaching when I was in the National Football League. I got to learn from you know Pat Shermer, who's the head coach of the Giants now, was my offensive coordinator when I was in uh, when I was in Philadelphia, and I learned a lot from Sherm and a lot of the other guys that were on our staff there and in San Francisco. So um, the biggest thing for us is just getting to know the players that we have now at UCLA, and then what do we have that can put them in positions to make plays. So. Yeah, it's a wide open deal right now. You know, I, um, we had three quarterbacks that competed for us in the spring, and then we've added two more here in the off season. So, so we'll see how that plays itself out. But really, just who can move us, um, and who, who has a command and a and an understanding of what we're trying to get accomplished on the offensive side of the ball. You know, can you can you put us in position to kind of stay out of harm's way? Um, you know, and, and and not try to stay away from the self inflicted wounds. You know, if we can have somebody that can, uh, you know, put us in situations where we're always kind of in a positive, you know, we're we, we understanding that we don't have to throw for a home run. We can go from first and 10 to second and five, and that's not a bad thing. And we get us into manageable third down situations and, and just try to keep us on the field, you know, so that we can kind of try to establish a rhythm. So, um, you know, that's, that's part of what we're going into now. We're, we're just a really young football team, you know, and, and as you know, you've been there, you know, we only have eight seniors. So I think um, some people look at it as a negative. I look at that as a positive. We got a lot of youth and it, it, it'll be a lot of fun trying to get them and going in the right direction. How do you change the culture there for the last 20 years has been one of failure and big moments? How do you change that culture? What, yeah. you, what makes you think you can change it? I, I think probably the first thing is not to dwell on the past. So I, I wasn't there, so I couldn't really specifically say why things happened one way or why things happened in another way. Um, you know, try to be a forward-thinking operation. And um, I think a lot of it comes from uh, if you can help instill confidence in the, in the players. And a lot of that is confidence based on demonstrated ability. So do, do you put them in situations that are going to occur in games? on a continual basis in practice and in your training sessions so that when they come up during games, it's not, oh my God, what do I do here? It's, hey, I've done this before. I feel confident in, in what we're gonna do. I feel confident in executing this plan. So um, I think the, the proper preparation from a training standpoint helps you eliminate some of those things. Um, and and I, again, I think sometimes people dwell too much on the past of this happened, this happened, this happened as well. A lot of those kids weren't there 20 years ago. You know, A lot of those kids don't even know who was on those teams and, and, and aren't concerned with that. What they're concerned with is, is, is what's going to happen in the future, and that's what we're going to try to focus on. Uh, 
Uh, I think he's a uh, competitor, you know, and I talk to people that were around him and understand him. Um, he also has a, a, a 16 games experience at the college level, you know, and we don't have a lot of experience at the quarterback level right now. Um, so I think he's going to bring a maturity to him. You know, it was, it was interesting. I'd never been in the grad transfer world, and that's one thing that we've talked about earlier that has changed in college football, I think, in it started in 11 or 12 when the rule first came in, and there was like 10. Now there's like 200. Um, but it was enjoyable. I, when we talked to Wilton, um, he said the, the biggest thing that when he was getting recruited at Michigan coming out of high school is there was a cookie in his room with his number on it. He thought that was the coolest thing. And now that he's a grad transfer, he wanted to talk about, you know, what our um, – course of study he was going to be in and what type of offense we were in those are the only two things that concerned him so um you're getting a guy that's got some maturity to him that that's not he's kind of been there done that you know and i think he he's there for a reason um he wants to get a, he wants to get a degree from from ucla from the graduate school and he he wants to play football and, and uh i'm excited about adding that experience to that room speaking of grad transfers what's been your impression of justin murphy so far um, Murph's been, from what I understand from our strength coaches, has been good. You know, we obviously can't work with those guys until next Friday, um, but it's another guy at a, at a position that we're really young at that we brought in a veteran player that started a lot of football games at the college level that, you know, will we'll add a little bit of veteran leadership to that room. So um, I know talking to our strength and conditioning staff, they've been excited about his work ethic and what he brings. Um, but there's a, there's a newness to a, to a lot of the things that we're going to, that, that are going to hit us on, on next Friday because um, there's about, 40 new faces that weren't with us in the spring that, that we're excited to get working with. So, and Physically, he's fine? His knee's fine? Yeah, he's been, according to our guys, that, that, that he's been really good in workouts and, and hasn't had any ill effects of that knee injury. So, Coach, there, last season, it, it seemed like in the second half, the Bruins just didn't have the same energy as they did in the first half in a lot of the games. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, from what you've seen so far, do you think this was a strength and conditioning issue, or is this just mental discipline? I don't know, and, and I really haven't spent a lot of time on what went on in the past because I wasn't here. So for me, and even if I came up with the answer, I don't know if that would help me do anything. So, Are you doing yeah. anything different on strength and conditioning? It's yeah, we have a brand new – everybody's new at our place, so it's, it's uh, new strength and conditioning, new nutrition, new coaching staff, new everything. So, um, you know, we're, we're not concerned with what went on there before we got there. We're concerned with what, what's going on moving forward. So, Coach? It's just, I mean, I understand what happened, and, and um, we wish him the best of luck in his, his next stop. But, you know, I understand where our school stood on the situation, and uh, I'm 100% behind our school in terms of what happened. So. You talked about bringing in guys that you knew where they stood No, I mean, everybody has to get cleared finally by the clearinghouse and how that works, and that's, that's where um, the holdup was. It was with the testing service, so. Past UCLA coaches have always talked about trying to get out of the shadow of USC. They've always addressed it. If you felt that in the last six, eight months, how would you address that? No, I think maybe you go back to Coach Wooden, and I think what you learned from Coach Wooden, who's been around for a long time, is that – and he didn't talk about other opponents. He was just concerned with his own team, and I think that's where sometimes we all have a certain amount of energy to expend on a daily basis, and if our energy is expended on what we think is going on somewhere else, and I think we're wasting our energy. I think what we need to focus our energy on is, is how do we improve and how do we improve on a daily basis and, and continue to, to get these kids to develop you know, from day one to day two to day three and not be concerned with is there a shadow or not a shadow. Um, the short time that I've been in Los Angeles, there aren't many shadows because there aren't many clouds in the sky, so we're not really concerned about the shadow part of this deal. You talked about conditioning and nutrition. You've done some things at Oregon that were sort of new and cutting edge. Yeah. How far has that evolved, or is it the same stuff? No, it, it's really evolved, I think, because that world has evolved. I think when you look everywhere from, you know, what is the new craze to Orange Theory to CrossFit to whatever's going on in the, in the public sector to how many people in this room right now are wearing Fitbits and counting their steps and trying to walk circles around those chairs to get to 10,000. So um, the world has changed in the, in the last five years, and... Um, I think what you have to do, though, is you have to be, what can we apply to our stuff? Because there's so much information out there that sometimes you can get overwhelmed by it and say, you know, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and then you also lose sight of what you're trying to do. I, I think um, what we're trying to do is that, is that can we be at our best every Saturday that we have an opportunity to play? And that's where um, our training regimen is set so that how we train allows us to maximize our potential on a Saturday. and, and at least give us a shot in the games that we're going to play. So. Chip, there's been this some deal? discussion uh, in other conferences about uh, releasing an injury report, something mandating that for each mm -hmm. team. 
Uh, if the Pac-12 were to do that, or how would you feel about that? I know you've been in the NFL where they require that, and also at Oregon where they didn't. Uh, where do you fall on that issue? Uh, uh, just tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> so if they mandated it, you would have no No, problem. if they mandated it, what am I going to say, no? But otherwise, <laughs> if they mandated, rather not. I, I don't care. So I don't, I mean, that's just one extra thing for me to do during the week. If I don't have to do it, then I don't have to do it. And in the NFL, the coaches don't do it. The trainer does it anyway. So people want to know who's playing, they're playing. I don't know. I don't, I don't really care. I don't fall into that stuff. So what do you want? <laughs> what do I want? Yeah. I think it'd be easier for us if there were injury reports. Yeah, because you wouldn't only have to write stories about injuries, right? That uh, we do write a lot of those. That's so true. help you out. <laughs> I'm good to go on, on, the, on next Friday. So <laughs> All right. we'll see how we do it. I really don't care. I know it's a big question, and I know it's about gambling, and that's they, say, they don't want to say it's about gambling, but it's about gambling. So if you want to support gamblers, then tell them who's injured. If you don't want to support them, then don't tell them who's injured. Maybe they got to figure it out on their own, so I don't know. But there's been gambling everywhere. That's another thing. It's not like yeah. when they pass this new rule that people are going to go, oh, my God, we can gamble now? If, you've been, if, you've, if you feel like that, then you're living in a hole because there's been gambling going on for a long time. Are there other concerns when it comes to sports betting that – crop up when you're a not that we've I mean people have bet on yeah. sports for a long time so I don't think it's just because states made it legal to do it um I think some people I'm guessing may have been doing it illegally for a long time but what uh, yeah exactly so I don't I don't think it's as big a I don't think it's a controversy so but if the league tells us to then we will and the NFL wasn't an issue our trainer handled it and who's probable who's questionable or who whatever the the numbers were any plans that's for not a big deal changes what's that plans for any new uniform changes? No, I, I think our uniforms are iconic and uh, sometimes I think in you know the Penn States, the UCLA's, the Alabamas of the world I think uh, are, are in the are in people can easily identify them so I don't think there's a, there are no plans now for us to do it and, and when I talk to the Troy Aikmans of the world he likes our uniforms so if Troy likes them I like them. Okay. When it comes to injuries are there some guys who will start out not 100 percent Able to go on this I haven't got anybody. I think right now we, we, it sounds like everybody should be good, but I, I won't get that till um, we get back in the office on Monday and start to talk about it. There may be a couple guys that tweak the thing or two during, uh, during the summer, but uh, it sounds like everybody's on track to participate on the second, but we'll see. What should UCLA fans expect this year? Is this clearly a rebuilding for you? What, what do you, I mean, how, how do you temper their expectations? Their expectations, I know what they yeah. are. Are you going to temper them or how do I, I, I don't think my job is to temper or excite them. My job is to prepare our team as best we can to play Cincinnati. Um, you know, and part of that is, is to not worry about, and, and I think in this day and age with the kids that we coach, um, I think they have to learn to kind of block out the outside noise. So if, if, if they have a head coach that's not blocking out the outside noise but is telling them to block out the outside noise isn't the way to do it. So we've always been pretty good at just kind of focusing, concentrating on what, what we can get accomplished and what we need to get accomplished. And, um, if there are expectations, that's a good thing. Um, I'd rather be at a place where there are expectations than a place where they don't care. Um, and it's obvious in the short time that I've been here that people really care about it. So, you know, we're excited to go out there and play. Um, well, I love the league. You know, and I, I just think it was so. Um, everybody has a shot. You know, and when you look at. If you're if you're not ready to play every single week in the Pac-12, then you get a shot of getting knocked off. And, and uh, you know, in some conferences, there's there's a level up here, and then there's a level down here. And very rarely you're like, oh, that team beat that team. That usually doesn't happen. But you know, you look at every weekend in this league, and it's like this team just beat that team. This team just beat that team. Even when I sat out last year, I'm watching the Friday night game when USC is a top-ranked team in the league, and they go up to play Washington State and Pullman, and, and they get beat. You know, but if, if you've been around this league long enough, if, you don't, if you're not prepared when you go to Pullman, Washington, you're going to get beat. You know, so I think the one thing about this league that I've loved, and no matter, there's been a ton of coaches that have come and gone, but the competitive level from top to bottom of this league has always been fantastic, so I enjoyed that part of it. UCLA's got some upcoming out-of-conference games, home-and-home uh, home with LSU, Georgia, Oklahoma. Yeah. Are you in favor of yeah. aggressive out of conference? Well, in our schedule this year, we play uh, Cincinnati at home, at Oklahoma, Fresno State. We have an open date. We're going to play the Tampa Bay Bucks, and then we're going to start the league conference schedule. So, um, no, nah, I love it. Do you like the aggressive out of conference schedules? Like I, lo I love playing. LSU. Yeah, I mean, we played LSU when I was at Oregon. We signed on for that. We played at Michigan. We played at Tennessee. Um, I think when people talk about, you know, how to strategically schedule, I think the first time you start thinking about strategically scheduling, you've lost. 
because you don't think you can compete with people. And if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So if they want to play us and we want to go play them, then I'll play anybody. So I'm, I'm excited when I looked at our schedule. Um, I think UCLA, USC, and Notre Dame are the only three schools that have never played a 1AA team. You know, and I think that's part of the uh, something that I think they hang their hat on, and I really agree with that. So uh, I'd love to play all, all great teams. So, um, and, and I know teams want to come play in the Rose Bowl. So, if, if you know, all those games, what I think are really cool are home and homes that have been set up. So, um, we got Michigan home and home. We have LSU home and home. Um, Georgia home and home. I think Rutgers just dropped us, so we're, they're they're trying to fill a hole for that one. Um, and it's a short window, but we're open to playing anybody. So, what's it going to be like returning to Autzen Stadium as an opposing coach this time? Uh, it'll be difficult to be honest with you because it's it's a special place and it's uh, one of the real hallowed grounds of college football. And I think if you've ever played a game in Autzen Stadium, whether you were the home team or the visitor, you'll remember it. So uh, uh, it's a special fan base, and um, I know how difficult it is for opposing teams to go in there and win. Um, because that fan base is unbelievable. And even though it's not the biggest stadium in college football, it's the loudest stadium in college football. So um, it's going to be a difficult task for us when we, go, when we head up there. How are you expecting to be received by the fans? I don't know. You know, we'll see. Depends on where we are. If we're, we don't have any wins and we go in there, I think they'll be excited when we come showing up. If we go in and we're undefeated, maybe they're not going to like us. So I don't really know. What's, what's the team? Is this going to look like your Oregon team? That's what fans are asking. They're wondering, are they going to see a team that looks like your team's in Oregon? That no, and, and I, I think change? that's if you, if you, I think that's that's not fair to anybody, to be honest with you, because I think it's every team has a different um, dynamic, and, and I think it's based upon what your personnel is. So to say that this guy used to coach here, so this is going to look yeah, like yeah, this, right. yeah, and I understand that, and 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 they, sh you know. Maybe that's a positive because they want to see what that looks like. But I think our job is to put our players in position to make plays. So, um, and I'm not being evasive. We, we we only have eight seniors, so we didn't have a lot of guys in spring ball. So there's going to be a bunch of guys that just showed up that are going to play for us just because of sheer numbers. So exactly how it's going to look, I'm not sure how it's going to look. Um, I'm excited. I think that's the fun part of coaching of what it's going to look like. But it, what we don't get caught up in is what does it look like. It's just how does it work. So whether we're driving a car that looks good on the outside, as long as it gets me from point A to point B, I'm happy. So whether we run for a first down, throw for a first down, have someone pick another person up and carry them for a first down, it's still a first down. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to get first downs and stop people. And, and I think if we're going to be successful at UCLA, we, we, it really starts on the defensive side of the ball because I think one thing that people don't realize or maybe just kind of glossed over is when we were really good at Oregon is because we were really, really good on defense. You know, our offense got a ton of notoriety, but Deion Jordan, Kiko Alonso, Michael Clay, DeForest Buckner, Eric Armstead, Terrence Mitchell, all guys that are playing in the NFL still right now were tremendous defensive football players. They just didn't get enough credit. But we were really good because we were really good on defense. And for us to be really good at UCLA, we're, we're going to have to get really good on the defensive side of the football. From the personnel you've seen on defense from spring, do you think you have a chance? Yeah, we have the makings of it. You know, we're, there's a couple positions that we don't have a ton of depth at um, that I think some of the young kids are going to have to play just because of the numbers. Um, but I like our secondary. I think there's depth in our secondary. Um, I think we've got some skilled linebackers. Uh, there's a few kids, Josh Woods, Jalen Phillips, um, that didn't play in the spring, so I hadn't seen a snap out of those guys. So I'm excited to see what those guys look like because it sounds like they'll be cleared to go when we, when we get back. Um, Caleb Wilson is the same way. He's another kid that's a really talented player at the tight end spot that, you know, we didn't get a chance to see Caleb at all during the spring. Uh, Colin Samuels, another kid we didn't get to see at all during the spring. So um, there's a few unknowns that we don't know about that are returning veteran players, um, but they weren't cleared for spring ball, but they will hopefully, knock on wood, will be cleared for um, August. So it, it, it'll be interesting, but I, I like the makings of what we have there. Um, I just hope we can get some depth developed. How does Theo Howard uh, fit in your offensive scheme, given how explosive he is? Yeah, I think Theo's a great fit for what we do. I think he's obviously a threat that everybody has to be concerned with. Um, he's got outstanding speed. He's a great route runner. He, he, he's got tremendous hands. Um, he's extremely consistent. You know, so I think if you're a quarterback, he, he's going to be one of the guys that you become very familiar with just because you can kind of count on him to be where he's supposed to be and when he's supposed to be there and to catch it. So uh, I'm excited to see what, what Theo's season looks like coming up. He's more of a, a quiet guy. Do you expect him to uh, become more of a leader on the team? Yeah, I don't think being a quiet guy or not a quiet guy has anything to do with being a leader. I think being a leader starts with doing the right things all the time, and that's what Theo does. So he's obviously a leader right now for us. If I was a coach and someone 
asked me how I felt about you coming back to the league, I would be scared, you know what. They've asked, all the coaches have been asked about how they feel about you coming back, and they've been glowing that, you know, it's great for the league, blah, blah, blah. They're pretty happy, and I know you're friends with some of them, but if you believe all of them? Yeah, I, I don't think, and I think in this deal is, most of us are, are, are pretty close and have known each other for a long time, so um, there's inherent rivalries that go on in college sports all the time. And, you know, when I was at Oregon, and our rival is Oregon State, and Mike Riley was a head coach at Oregon State, and I love Mike Riley. And everybody would get mad of, how can you love Mike Riley? He's at Oregon State. I'm like, have you met him? You know what I mean? He's just a class man. He's one of the classiest guys in college football. So um, I think as coaches, we're competitors. It's like brothers. You know, I, I won't beat the bag out of my brothers, but um, but you love them. You know, and, I, and there's a lot of guys here that, that I've known for a long time. I've competed with David. Me and David Shaw are very good friends. David came over all the time when I was at the 49ers. I'd go to his practices. He'd come to my practices. When Chris Peterson was at Boise, he'd come visit us at Oregon. We'd spend time talking football. So um, I was at Texas A&M for three days last year with Kevin Sumlin, visiting with him and talking football with him and coaching with him. So um, we're in a big fraternity. We're all at different schools and I know our schools are rivals and compete against each other but um, we, we, we have a healthy respect for each other it's not a hate it's a it, no, I mean it like yeah I understand that <laughs> but just a follow-up who was the first coach to text you uh, when you did think that you remember or? I don't I we jumped on a plane right after I took the job and then I actually it was fun because we had no wi-fi so I didn't talk to anybody yeah. and then I got off the plane and and my phone had blown up so I, I couldn't tell you exactly who was number one but there was a lot of um, good ones, especially the, the ones that were tied to UCLA, the Terry Donahue's and the Dick Vermeil's. That, and I got to know Coach Vermeil really well when I was at Philadelphia. So, so to hear from those guys was really special. Your arrival in LA has been equated to sort of, excuse me, LeBron James coming, Manny Machado coming, oh. Big Star coming. How, no, how let's you, slow down there. No, no, I mean. Me and Bron, let's go. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> but just the, the, all this, the stars, LA's bringing the stars. Do you feel. Have you sense? Sorry about that. Do you have you sense that at all or not? No, I think the cool thing about LA is that there's so many cool people here. Is that everybody kind of fits in. So uh, the other good thing about LA is I know for a fact I am not the prettiest person in the room. So there's there's a lot of other people that, that they can look at and kind of. We just want to kind of keep our heads down and go to work. So um, you know, I, I I think we're very insulated in the world that we live in. So you know, you leave your house at five thirty, you go to work, you're on campus all day long, and then I go home, so I don't. We're not. We're not really get exposed. I, I know that, and that's why I know exactly who LeBron James is. Okay. Okay. So to put me and LeBron in the same sentence is the fact that we're both residents in Los Angeles is about as far as that one goes. So we got two minutes remaining with UCLA. Two minutes. It's been a while since you've been in New Hampshire, but uh, mm -hmm. Colorado plays them right before. Yeah. Play Colorado. I was talking to Mike about that. Yeah. So what can Colorado expect out of Coach McDonald's team? That they're going to they're going to be really well coached. They're going to be fundamentally sound. They're going and they're going to play their tails off. You know that's has been his hallmark since he's been there. I think they've been in the national playoffs 14 times in a row. You know he's the probably the the most consistent performer at the, at the FCS level. Um, and and they've had a history of of beating 1A teams when they play up. So, um, but they know Mike's got a really talented team this year too. So it's it's going to be a it's going to be a heck of a game. So. Yeah, hopefully they can do something to them that we can learn from it. So uh, I know I'll talk to them after they play them. So. I think everybody's equal, but, but I don't. I think he has experience because he's played. You know, and I so I think that there's not a newness. If he were to take a snap in a game, it's not the first time he's taken a snap in a game. And I think all of us um, are byproducts of experience. You know, we. There's a lot of times we have a plan, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, if I could do that over again, you know, I'd be, I'd be a little bit different." Um, but you know, I, I think he, he fits in really well with, with what our room is like right now, and, and I'm excited to see kind of how it plays itself out. You know, I, I think a lot of times you go into things and you'd like to really know. You know, going into year two and Marcus got red shirt, but going into year two, we knew Marcus was our quarterback, and you don't have to worry about it. But I've also almost every other year have been in quarterback. You know competitions, and, and I think it brings out the best in them. So, you know, we're excited to see how it plays itself out. Yeah, I, I had coached with Derek before at New Hampshire, so I had a, a great uh, understanding and in, in for what he's all about. Um, and so, uh, whenever I got a, a job at the college level, he was someone I knew I wanted to reach out to. Um, and we're really excited that he's coaching our tight ends. And then Roy, 
Um, came really highly recommended from Alex Grinch, who's another guy that I've coached with that was at Washington State and um, really needed a special teams coordinator and think he's a rising star in this profession. So I was excited to get both those guys. You know, there's like three times as many media here as normally for a UCLA foot. Are you okay with that? <laughs> I, I don't it know could be that way like. all year. I don't know what it was like. I, I, that means we're doing good things. So I know if, if we go 0 for 5, there's not going to be that many bills. So <laughs> let, let's just hope that we have this, this turnout again. So we, right, that'll we're excited it about for it. UCLA. Is that it, Dave? Appreciate it. Thank you. Does anybody want a water bottle?